This is Michael Tech and Strode uh, coming to you live from the breathing room uh, space. Um, this is an Ujima Awa first, a special edition even. Um, we've actually graduated in the course of about five months from me recording these episodes in my home uh, to, you know, a bit of time in my one of my corporate offices um, and to shifting over to Floods Hall. And now we've, we've graduated right on to field recording. Um, so right now we're satellite, we're running satellite at the breathing room space. And I've managed to transport, you know, a, a, a large, a, a fair amount of kit, you know, from uh, the space at Floods Hall that we had uh, kind of been building out over here to the breathing room. Because tonight we're going to be talking to Damon Williams of the Let Us Breathe Collective. Um, so right now he's actually facilitating. Um, the, the Let Us Breathe Collective is launching their Freetown 2020 um, series this summer, land and space activation. And so that's something that Damon will talk to us uh, when, he, when he arrives in a moment. Um, as I said, he's downstairs facilitating. And so here um, we are experimenting with this satellite facilitation. Um, I am petrified of change. I don't like change, right? Um, you know, and, and that, that's a funny thing to say because, you know, I am sort of perpetually shifting myself into spaces where I am forced to grapple with change. Um, but you know, what we're going to be doing tonight is is another opportunity to experiment, um, you know, something that we, we, we enjoy doing at the Colonet Collaborative, um, you know, really building out our acumen for collaborative infrastructure, for collaboration, and, um, and, and really testing, you know, the measure of some of the equipment that we've gathered around these episodes of the Ujima Hour um, as we ultimately try to, to map the city and try to map the community economies, try to map the cultural economies of the city um, using these episodes episodes as, as a sort of a container for these conversations, right? These are conversations that I had been having personally, and these are conversations that I ultimately wanted to expand out into the wider world so that we could grapple with these conversations and grapple with these ideas together. Um, these ideas do not have to live solely in my head or solely in the heads of those, you know, with whom I'm in conversation, but these are things that can live out in the world. And these are things that we, we might all be thinking about, right? We might all be collapsing these ideas together, but, you know, the opportunity to give voice to them inside of this broadcast um, and to create a container where these conversations can, can spread and reach others and that others can join in the conversation ultimately um, creates a space where we can envision what is the economy of the future, right? What is the sort of anti-capitalist vision of an economy that we could be engaged in? What is the black social and solidarity economy that we are ultimately trying to, um, to build up, to cultivate inside of our communities, inside of our lives, inside of our organizations? Um, and, and how can we make sure that we are all aligned and in common vision around that notion of an economy because ultimately all of our work is really shaped by it, right? Um, we, when we are in pursuit um, of, of specific types of resources and, and types of funding, you know, we are ultimately either participating in an economy that, it, that is exploitative and extractive, or we are actually trying to create and express a different vision of an economy um, that might be restorative, that might be reparative. Um, so that is what we're doing here on the Ujima Hour. I am Michael Tekken Strode of the Colonet Collaborative. Uh, so so uh, I, I thank you for tuning into the broadcast this evening. Um, so what have I been up to? Um, well, first, you know, just let me kind of highlight because I recognize that there are so, some folks who might tune in who might not know what the Cold Nut Collaborative is. So I should stop there and make sure that I explain to you. The Cold Nut Collaborative is uh, Chicago's only time-based skill and sharing, sharing exchange. Um, so what, what does that mean? That means that we are ultimately um, a bank where people can can place a, a record of their, the things that they're requesting, the things that they are offering, the things that they need, right? You can have a, a record of those things placed inside of the time bank, and people trade those skills and trade those services um, using time as the currency. So every hour is equal to an hour, right? You know, there's, there's no sort of hierarchy and in, in, in weights and measures and payments here. Everybody's hour is equal inside of time banking because ultimately what we are trying to do is not trying to create a currency that can compete and match with the dollar, but we are ultimately trying to create a currency that incentivizes people to participate in projects that might have social good, but may not have significant financial good, right? Um, but ultimately, you know, in our measure, in our vision, um, the social good actually is, is, uh, is 
is much more rewarding in a sense, right? You know, when you talk about social cohesion and when you talk about social infrastructure, these are the things that ultimately um, hold communities and societies together, right? This is the fabric, this is the web that holds us together. And so time banking is really about us mapping out the network of skills and assets and things that exist inside of our community and our human capacity to do work, right? Um, and then trying to get communities to share those things um, using sort of non-monetary or non-dollar based exchanges, right? Um, because ultimately what we're trying to do is again, build relationships and build community capacity and build that cohesion, um, which is the platform for all those other projects that we wanna do, right? Um, so that's what the Coldenet Collaborative has been engaged in. And the way that we've been doing that work is um, we've been hosting a recently, you know, of course, you, you know, you've heard on this broadcast, our monthly time salons. So a monthly time salon happens on the fourth Friday of every month at Floods Hall from uh, 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Um, Floods Hall is located at 1515 East 52nd Street on the third floor. Um, so the, the, the fourth Friday of every month. Um, so we'll be back again here at the, the end of March. Um, so please do uh, make sure that you check us out at Floods Hall. Um, I'll make sure that that event is posted in the comments section of this video um, briefly. But um, what, I, what I do want you know folks to know is that um, we see these time salons as, again, another one of these containers um, that is about getting people to practice this act of time banking. So it's not just the sort of theoretical thing, but when we get inside of these time salons and do these offers and needs market, and we've done them um, presently, we've done them at the, the food Pol Chicago Food Policy Summit. So um, if you were there at the Chicago Food Policy Summit on February 21st, you had an opportunity to participate in an offers and needs market there. Um, if you will be at the Chicago Community Gardeners Association Conference on March 21st, we'll have another offers and needs market there. And if you were in Oak Park at Compound Yellow, um, you know, uh, that, that was on February 29th. That was Leap Day. Yes. So we were there in Oak Park on the west side on Leap Day um, doing another time salon at Compound Yellow and ultimately um, working to, I uh, just want to make sure that message isn't relevant. Um, ultimately, just making sure that um, if folks want to cultivate time banking on the west side, they have access and they have an avenue on which they can do that. Um, and, and so we were building out um, the, the possibility of a platform for time banking um, that, that lives in Compound Yellow and that can, can, can have its expression in Oak Park and in Austin communities um, as, they, as they are thinking about actively how you can share some of the sort of overwhelming um, privilege and potential of Oak Park and, you know, make sure that that spills into Austin in a really meaningful way, right? You know, so it's not, it, it, you know, uh, money is critical. <laughs> it is critical that if you have money and, you know, and, and you are living next to a, dis a divested community that you pour your money into that community. But it's also critical that you, you, you think about other ways that your time, talent and resource can live inside of that community. And time banking is one of the ways that we were offering at Compound Yellow and offering to um, Oak Park and Austin um, as, as ways that we can, can um, that you can invite that sort of participation inside of a space. Um, so th that's, uh, that's what we're working on with the, in terms of the time salon. Um, other things that, that are going on uh, here. So we just had our, our last meeting of the um, of Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. Uh, that happened yesterday. Um, we had co-facilitation by Sochi Espinosa of the Co-op Ed Center, uh, and Sochi was ultimately um, helping us to think about the cooperative culture of our organizations through the use of, of community agreements, right? And I'm sure that, you know, we've gone through community agreements in some form, at, at, at some, in some form and in some way before. Um, but the way that Sochi broke down sort of community agreements, it was about taking the principles, the cooperative principles that we were studying, in, that we've been studying in the context of this uh, Co-op for Lib study and working group, and then thinking about if you look at a principle like empathy, right? If you take a principle like empathy, what is a lived practice that we can embody, that we can, it, we can put forward that will actually present that we um, recognize empathy as a value in this organization, right? You know, in this body of the Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. If we were trying to practice empathy, what would that look like as an organizational guideline or an organizational uh, practice or ritual or something, right? Um, and, and so, you know, when you're thinking about empathy and you're thinking about 
what it looks like to to place yourself in someone else's context, right? Um, then you know, um, I, I think one of the things that we came up with. In fact, we we may not have broke, may, may not have come up with this for empathy, but this actually applies. But we were talking about um, needs, right? And one of the practices that we came up with for one of the values that we were breaking down was um, ask instead of assuming others needs right so if you were to, to to ask about someone's needs instead of assuming what those needs are um, that's the practice of you having a greater deal of imp a greater uh, level of empathy for that person because ultimately you know um, again if you're trying to put yourself in somebody's context you don't want to assume what that context is you want to actually go through the process of building a relationship and learning what that context is. Um, so cooperation, collaboration, study, and working group. Um, we meet every um, every other week, um, every other Sunday, bi-weekly on Sunday from 3 to 6 p.m. at the Breathing Room Space, um, which is 1434 West 51st Street. Um, so we encourage and invite you to come out. Um, so the next session uh, there will be will happen on um, for doing that. Yeah, I don't have a calendar up. <laughs> Forgive me on that. But you know, that that's nonetheless. I'll make sure that, that that event's posted in um inside of the um inside of the comment section so that you can uh, make sure that you are there at that next session. Um the twenty second. There we go. Twenty second. Uh, March twenty second. Um, that's the next session of the Co Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. Um, and we'll have that day Dr. Stacy Sutton, who's going to be co-facilitating, who's going to be talking to us about some of the feasibility plans that the UIC uh, Center for um, Urban Pop for Center for Urban Policy and the Urban Planning and Policy Administration, CUPA, UIC CUPA. Um, Dr. Stacy Sutton is going to be with us talking about some of those feasibility plans and some of the work that UIC CUPA does with cooperatives um, to to develop and to kind of cult, to to think about um, is the business plan that they've laid out feasible. Um, and if it's if, if there's a challenge, if there's a challenge to the feasibility of that business plan, what are some of the things that you know um, can be done that would actually increase the feasibility, increase the possibility that whatever business this community has laid out is going to be successful? Um, so yes, so we've got we've got two things coming up for you. Um, so again, I've already mentioned the fourth Friday time salon. Um, that's going to be March 27th at Floods Hall, 1515 East. Uh, 52nd Street, third floor, uh, 6 p.m. is going to be the start time there. Um, we wrap up generally around 7.30, and I'm a stickler for time because, you know, I recognize that I don't necessarily just want to be hanging out there, you know, at, at a sort of dialogue focus or dialogue heavy venue um, on a Friday night. I actually like to go dance. Dirty little secret. Um, but, yeah, so March 27th will be there at Floods Hall. Um, March 22nd, um, we'll be here at the Breathing Room Space, 1434 East uh, 51st Street, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. for Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. And, um, and shortly, we will have on Damon Williams from the Let Us Breathe Collective, who will be um, talking to us about some of the things that are going on here at the Breathing Room Space, including uh, Freetown 2020, um, including the... Um, you know, some of the activations, things that are going to be going on for the summer and uh, for the early fall um, that you can participate in. And, and ultimately, you know, trying to, to, again, dig into this vision of the black social and solidarity economy that this program is all about. So just a, a bit of um, a bit of history on the Ujamaa hour. Um, you know, we, we are now in um, our second full year of broadcast. Um, we, we had sort of a, 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 a sort of end of quarter um, thing that happened around 2018 uh, when this broadcast launched. And when the broadcast launched, I was curious, right? Um, I had become engaged in this process of cultivating the time bank. And in the process of building out the time bank, I had been having conversations um, with people about a different vision, um, a different economic vision, right? And in the context of having these conversations, I began, I became curious about where these projects were in, uh, you know, in black communities throughout the nation, and, and ultimately, um, what were some of the shared values? What were some of the shared principles that we were operating on? And so the Ujima Hour, um, it, it grew out of that, right? Um, it, you know, something you can still see in the, the, the logo for the broadcast is the flag of, um, of uh, Bridge, um, the Bridge Embassy for Black America, um, Tequila Shabazz. Um, and, you know, and, and 
inside of the group uh, Biba, you know, there's a group on Facebook called Biba. Um, there was some rece receipt sharing going on. And so they were thinking about cooperative economics, certainly from a consumer focus, you know, from the, the ability of consumers to purchase the goods of other black producers, um, but to actually shift from simply that consumption focus of cooperative economics to a sort of both producer and stewardship focus of cooperative economics. So what does it look like to live cooperative economics from the perspective that the community should be this, the lead steward and, and the self-determining sort of um, authority around the resources that exist inside of a community? What does that form of cooperative economics look like? And thus was born um, this this vision of uh, Movement Monday and the Ujama, Ujama Hour, which is a place where we can actually talk about talk about these projects and talk to people who are actually leading initiatives and leading projects um, that operate in that realm, um, that operate in this realm of the, the social and solidarity economy and really have these intimate and informal conversations with people um, who are working on solidarity economy initiatives. Um, so, you know, throughout our time, we, we've been able to talk to uh, Danielle M. Kali of Nexus Community Partners, Malia Connolly of uh, Village Financial um, Cooperative, uh, Latier Pythas of uh, Womanist Working Collective and Reciprocity Time Bank, um, Dara Cooper of National Black Food and Justice Alliance, um, Jamila Medley of the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, um, Dion Lucas of E.G. Wood, um, Katrina Baxter of Soil Generation, um, Tara... We, did not get to talk to Tara Hines of Black Permaculture Network. We do hold out hope, you know, we hold out hope that that conversation will come to pass at some point. Richard Wallace of Equity and Transformation, Imhotep Adisa of Keperu Institute, and then Yavet Holtz of Cowrie Village uh, Baobab. Um, so there's there's been, you know, a, a wealth of conversations that we've been able to have. That was actually just the 2019 conversations. That doesn't really cover the 2018 conversations when we talked to uh, Renee Hatcher, um, Dr. Stacy Sutton, um, we talked to NGR, well, we, we talked to Christina Brown of Counter Counterbalance uh, ATX on behalf of NGR Keith um, of uh, Black Sovereign Nation and both of the 400 plus one. Um, so that, that was some, uh, some uh, in-depth conversation in the 2018 sphere. And then we capped off 2018 um, with that conversation with Dr. Kamal Rashid. Uh, hopefully you have seen that reposted on the Colonet Collaborative website um, or Facebook page rather. Um, because ultimately, um, that was really about not only the, the Kwanzaa principle of Ujima, but that related the Kwanzaa principle of Ujima to the, um, the, the, the African socialist principle that Julius Nyerere pioneered of, of Ujima as a form of African socialism uh, with the Ujima villages um, that, that uh, he, he sought to undertake in, in Tanzania um, at the close of the colonial period there. Um, so ultimately, you know, these are, are, are conversations that have been containers for a different vision of economy um, and, and, and a cooperative vision of economy. Um, and, and, and you might even have it, you might even say it has socialist tendencies. Um, we're, we're unafraid of that word. But ultimately, you know, we are trying to think of a vision that is, uh, is, is propositional in nature, that, that proposes um, a new vision, a new economic vision, right, um, as we see it that is, is being practiced in, in, in black communities, right? Through these initiatives, through these projects, through the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, through 400 plus one, um, through Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, through East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, all of these are initiatives that have been undertaken in black communities that have seen uh, histories um, and, 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 and decades and, and, and centuries of divestment, um, you know, and centuries of extraction um, and centuries of, of resource exploitation. And, and labor exploitation, uh, you know, and ultimately the moment that they sort of, you know, turn inward and begin to develop initiatives and begin to develop projects, um, you know, we see that they do not develop projects that, that, that operate in, um, in, in the similar manner to sort of the, the same sort of, they, they don't choose the same corporate or nonprofit path, right? Um, they choose a path that generally, you know, is non-hierarchical. Um, they choose a path that that you know often is anti-capitalist in nature and you know anti-capitalist can mean a lot of things but you know um truly it often means that things are relationship based relationship focused um it often means that that the sort of connective tissue of things of uh, the center and the locus of activity is often um amongst the collective and amongst the community of people who are decision makers about a thing um it it often means that that again you know 
um, the way that they relate, the way that they engage is is social and societal in nature. And um, and so ultimately, you know, it, it boosts the collaborative potential of these projects and these initiatives. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily make it easy because, right, um, we, we spent years, you know, practicing in other systems, in other ways, right? Um, we, we, are, we are actively trained um, in the process of employment to, to work in a specific manner, um, to, 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 you know, mostly shed our autonomy when we go into workplaces, um, and, but to actually take ownership of a thing, right? To actually um, be in the process of, 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 of when you say, and to take ownership in a collective manner, to actually, to actively um, shed your power in the course of coming together with others around an initiative, um, these are the values that are often chosen um, in these initiatives and, and, and projects. And so um, these are the things that we've been covering on the Ujima Hour. Um, and these are the things that we, we ultimately hope to see um, more of, right? We hope that you know these conversations in the Ujima Hour actually foster more of these, in, of these initiatives, we, we, or, or at least to have these initiatives talk to each other. And that is happening. Um, that's actually something that I did not highlight, but you know, uh, Co-op for Lib was actually involved on a panel with the East, Bur East Bay uh, Permanent, well, invited by East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative um, and Re Repaired Nations. Um, we were invited to a panel uh, that included um, Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, um, that included Mandela Food Cooperative, um, as ultimately, you know, to, to kind of highlight um, cooperative work that's happening in black communities, right? Um, and so that was something that, that we were able to participate in um, this past month in February um, that was recorded. Eventually that recording will make its way to the light of day and we will be able to share it with others. Um, but ultimately, you know, um, it, it's not simply about these, these um, projects happening in isolation, but it's when these projects actually have conversations with each other, when they begin to share their values, share their principles, share their ideals, share their, share their strategies and best practices um, that ultimately we can hope to lift other initiatives um, up, right? You know, to, to kind of empower other initiatives to take off, to take flight. Um, so that is something that we're actively doing here on the Ujima Hour. Um, and we thank you for taking this journey with us. Um, and so, I just want to highlight um, some of the things that we, we have been covering so far. So, so ultimately, we have been covering those um, five elements or sort of those five principles in the course of our broadcasting. Uh, we've been talking a bit about cooperation uh, over competition, right? You know, so again, um, a core value, a core... Um, a core value and a core principle um, that grounds how we came to the, the, the discussions of Ujima Hour is really about this aspect of cooperation. Because ultimately, when we talk about cooperative economics, what underlies that is that, is that phrase, is that statement, is that word, cooperation. Um, and ultimately, we're trying to understand at its core, what does it mean, right? Um, what is the sort of society uh, building glue um, that, that actually causes people to, to come together around an initiative, around a project, um, and, and begin to cooperate, right? Um, what is the sort of mutual benefit that they find? Um, <laughs> God damn, you're coming here. I just want to invite him in, absolutely. Um, so what is the, the element of cooperation that you can feel free to attach that to yourself? It's button on top. Um, so, so in terms of cooperation, what is that glue that, that sort of binds people together around an initiative, around a project? So we talked um, early on in the broadcast about cooperation. Um, one of the other elements we touched upon is capital. Uh, just thinking about, you know, um, different frames for, for how we approach capital. Um, what is capital? Um, where does it live? Where does it exist? Where does it operate? How do we use it? Um, we've talked about um, this notion of economy and, you know, just what what is what is the sort of uh, the the way that we approach economy? What is an economy? How do we use the, how do we use economy? How is economy abused? Right? Um, how is that term? How is that frame? How is that language abused? Um, and we've talked about autonomy. Um, so just looking at um, how these principles of cooperation, capital economy, um, come together, and um, communities are seeking their autonomy by by utilizing sort of these three uh, these first three principles, um, and we've used that to kind of seek our autonomy in political spaces, in economic spaces, in social spaces. 
Boom. So those were our four principles, cooperation, capital, economy and autonomy. Um, so that's that's ultimately, you know, what we've been doing inside of the Ujima Hour is really just kind of tackling these principles, thinking about how they interoperate, thinking about how they come together and having uh, intimate and formal conversations that dig into people's ideas about these things. Um, and, and as you see sitting next here next to me, we've got uh, Damon Williams in the studio of Let Us Breathe Collective. So we want to welcome, welcome him through. Um, I'm just going to come in here and, you know, dig in here and just, you know, get this this young bio up oh, so we can, oh, yeah, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I, men I mentioned here um, a moment ago that we are broadcasting from the Let Us Breathe Collective. You know, um, this is an Ujima hour first. Um, before you go, just run your mic to say something. on. If One, you... two. Oh, um, oh, I didn't press the button. Yeah, boom. Uh, boom, you're there. Apologies, apologies. Okay. Boom, I think we got you. All there. right, all right. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, let me just turn this level down slight. All right, boom. Um, so I, I mentioned that we're here broadcasting from the Let Us Breathe Collective. Uh, the Let Us Breathe Collective is an alliance of artists and activists employing creative cultural organizing to imagine a world beyond prison and police. Uh, collective operates the breathing room space in the back of the yard, Chicago South up uh, on Chicago South Side. Uh, breathing room is a, a black-led liberation headquarters for arts, organizing, political education, and healing. Uh, our, our guest tonight here, Damon Williams, organizer, writer, MC, educator, founding member of the Let Us Breathe Collective, uh, co-host and co-executive producer of Ergo Radio, a weekly podcast and cultural media hub in Chicago, showcasing. The artists, rappers, poets, musicians, organizers, change makers, shape, reshaping the culture of the city. Strong young voices and country for a more equitable, for the more equitable and created. Um, and Ergo Radio is, uh, of course, fiscally sponsored uh, by Allied Media Projects. So you know, we want to go ahead and welcome in Damon Williams. Yes. Welcome to the platform. Uh, thank bro. you so much. Before <laughs> we even get going, I just want to say I really, really appreciate you. I respect and admire the way you always show up to space. I, I, I. I value and I learn from how passionate you are about these ideas, ideals, and, and concepts. And thank you for your grace of coming here. Uh, it was my bad and confusion on, on, on setting up with you. So I really appreciate you coming here, broadcasting something so important in our space uh, and being a minimal. So just thank you very much for having me. I'm, 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 I'm humbled. All right. Well, you know, it's much obliged, much appreciated. You know, it's a learning experience. You know, I mean, it's been, you know, to, to, to kind of come into the broadcast. I talked a bit earlier about, you know, this is our first field recording. We graduated from recording in my house to recording <laughs> at Floods Hall and at my mama's house in Huntsville. Now we out in the, in the field and, and uh, you know, uh, let us breathe. Oh, like this is beautiful. This is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, so. So we just came from downstairs, you know, talking about Freetown 2020. Mm -hmm. We'll um, dig into that in a little bit. Um, so trace the journey for us. You know, I mean, I'm sure, you know, they can be as broad or, or, or as neat as you as you want it to mm -hmm. be. But trace the journey for us that brings us um, from where you began to where we are now in terms of Freetown 2020. And so you say you, you mean the Let's Breathe Collective, or are you like trying to get some personal backstory in there too? I mean, well, t you know, ultimately I feel like, you know, the personal, well, the personal backstory, of course, does okay. inform okay. everything that we are. Okay, so, all right, know, yeah, all right. Into okay, it. so yeah, so I mean, um, it, it became clear that even though I didn't name it, I started doing this work when I was very, very young. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I probably was engaged in spaces around building and uplifting and uh, you know addressing inequality and inequity with my people, with black people since I was about five years old. Um, and what's interesting and why I'm excited to do this is because you know economics was always my entry point or my foundation uh, before I got into you know the social politics and the, the cultural artistic performance stuff, which is much more forefronted in like my, my public life right now. Um, but you know literally the word Cooperative economics, Ujima, uh, is is my is my cornerstone, is my backstory. So my mother um, started an investment club with her friends called Ujama, which is an Americanized pronunciation of Ujima, um, and then she started a, a youth program called Ujama Junior. Um, and so it's interesting because I'm certainly, you know, in opposition to some of the assumptions and ideals, because uh, it was certainly a hyper capitalist space. It was trying to teach young people with the assumption that Black people have not had. The proper knowledge of how to function within the market and so if we just participated better and made more rational 
more prudent decisions and then benefited from the growth of the system, right? Like we can address inequality through, through that, through grassroots. Right. And so the cooperative economics of it was how do we learn together? So it was more of an educational space, you know, because I'm five, six when I started, but it's teenagers and high school students, you know, right. learning about stocks, learning about um, assets at large, learning about entrepreneurship, uh, trying to have visions of what home ownership and real estate looks like. Uh, and so by the age of nine, I started doing public speaking and seminars because uh, it was, you know, I, I mastered it, you know, yes, the basics sir. at a very young age and always had a performative capacity. Uh, so my mother and I put together this like speech seminar. So I'll go around to different conferences wearing a little suit um, called the ABCs of investing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I did that for about 12 years. Um, you know, I did it, I did it really a lot during middle school and high school age. I, I, I won uh, an award. Uh, from the, the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, the Money Smart Kid of the Year, and then they they kept they did it every year, but they found I was like the most substantial speaker. So every year they did this festival and conference, trying to get more people involved in the banking system. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be one of the spokespersons to try to tell young people that through cooperative economics, even though I, we wasn't actually cooperative economics, it was cooperative learning to participate right. in the market. Um, <clears throat> We can, you know, it is accessible now, right? With the internet, with the lowering of prices, the lower of brokerage fees, some technical stuff. Yes. Within the 90s, you know, it became much more easy to invest. So you could do it with like $5, $20 a month. Um, and so that was my, my, my foundation. So then, you know, coming out of high, I got a lot of attention for that as well. Uh, so going out of high school into college, I saw myself as a change agent. Uh -huh. um, and so I had the driving question um, of, you know, I want to find out why the South and North side look so different more tangibly. I had an eye for institutions, had an eye for market, had an eye for systems, and how that affected my local community. That's how I was taught to invest, was right. look at what's happening in community, what's growing, what's new, uh, and then do research on that. Yes. Uh, and so I, you know, I went to college with, with those questions, and very quickly my, my understanding of structural racism uh, grew. Uh, I then had a language of capitalism and was able to then feel and understand some latent and some were explicit, but mostly latent contradictions in terms of uh, my social politics, but also um, my economic approach was definitely in align with the norms and standards of capital market. And I was in some ways a mascot of yes. like, look at this little black boy to do it. If you know, if he can do it, then shut up and pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Unwittingly, I kind of in retrospect feel like that's how I was deployed. Um, and so then, you know, developed this deep anti-capitalist politic, uh, started studying social movement, started studying revolution, uh, had a deep, deep study of the black power movement. Um, fortunate was to have a professor and mentor and advisor who was a former Panther and a former part of uh, NOIR, which was James and Grace Lee Boggs organization in Detroit. Um, and so, you know, and then also found my artistry in school, uh, so as a hip hop artist and performer. Uh, so, you know, found local artistic community through open mics, started having an expansive notion of structural systems of oppression and resistance, um, started learning about movement and revolution and, 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 and theories of change at like, you know, at a deep level. Uh, and then just like on the own, like watching Zeitgeist and <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> watching the Black Power mixtape and just anything yes. on YouTube I could find with Fred Hampton or, or Asada Shakur or whatever. Uh, and so I graduated in 2014. Uh, so me and my sister were an artistic duo, which that partnership in a lot, in a lot of ways was the, um, the locus for what became the Let Us Breathe Collective. Uh, we had the stage show called Lack on Lack, which was at Victory Gardens, and we were fortunate to get featured on the cover of The Red Eye that summer. So we were feeling ourselves, and like, oh, it's going to blow. We had been doing music for about two years at that time, uh, so it felt like I was coming home when we were about to take this step. Uh, and so the show was this multidisciplinary stage show that was talking about the intersections of race, class, and gender, but all... Um, like hidden or covered in me and Christiana's relationship as siblings, our relationship to our mother and our relationship to like systems and privilege. So yeah. I was explicitly trying to think about notions of revolution, but mask it and not say it explicitly and say it implicitly in, sub, in, in the subtext. Uh, and so that was cool. We felt cool. We got some attention. We got some media attention. That's July of 2014. And within about two weeks or so of this high point, Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson. Yeah. Uh, and not only was Mike Brown killed, and you know, another tragedy in the thousands of tragedies of, of, of dead black people right. at the hands of the state, uh, in, my, in recent history alone, um, there was uprising. And so like I said, I had just been studying deeply what is the relationship between rebellion and revolution. And I'm thinking like it's somehow, you know, I'll do some business or some community work and then by 50, I'll have established enough influence and power where like my, inf you know, my, th this knowledge I built and this approach will be able to have some type of impact 
because revolution is over. Uh, and then I saw a rebellion happening in the streets. Uh, and it, it was a deeply political space, as we all know. Uh, and so the Ferguson moment transformed us. It was just an initiative intended to bring down supplies. But we met a group of uh, uh, mostly young people, but it was actually just a group of people, uh, a group of folks that was real folks, you know, real people from the streets. Um, and that relationship transformed us, too. Uh, as well as then was the impetus for creating the Let Us Breathe Collective. Uh, and so then all of those ideas and all that backstory and trying to reconcile my own contradictions as well uh, is how our work started. So most of it was direct opposition to the police. Uh, but, you know, humbly speaking, we were one of the first groups to explicitly connect our action to an anti-capitalist politic. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the year of the no indictment of Mike Brown, um, we redubbed uh, Black Friday that year, Brown Friday. Um, and it was uh, before really like the national, like the two years or so after that, then like boycotting Black Friday became commonplace. Uh, but it was mostly because of the timing of when the no indictment happened. But then we were able to connect it to the fact that systems of capital, systems of consumption, uh, privileged elite interaction with corporations uh, is what shapes and contributed and perpetuated and protected the murder and murderer of Michael Brown. Uh, and so we called for a boycott that day connecting our consumption and connecting capitalism to militaristic violence, mm -hmm. um, connecting ourselves to labor and workers. Um, and so probably from that point on, so that's within our first two or so months or four, three or four months of existence, uh, our actions always had a redistributive quality. Uh, we have been doing actions where we're out marching in the cold and, and you know, we're worried about ourselves. We see people sleeping <laughs> in something like I'm mad. My, my toes are cold. Like, oh, man, I shouldn't be out here snowing. And there are people who have no other options. Uh, so very early on in our actions, it started with just like, let's bring as many sandwiches as we can. And, mm -hmm. call it, and it's not just for us. Right. It right. is to, you know, we are going to see people in need in doing this work and in naming our oppression abstractly or to some general target. Um, we have to redistribute resources. Um, and so then that later developed to the free store, which then is this larger idea. of. So I'm getting, you know, into all the work. So uh, so that that more or less brings us into the, the ethos of, of where we are now. So, you know, where I am in the story is, is 2014 still. Uh, and so we, we are now approaching six years later and we've just been developing and becoming more explicit in what um, cooperation at large, uh, politically, economically, socially, culturally uh, means because we know that if our vision and our mission is liberation and transformation, it can't happen without a new way of how we exchange and interact with each other, whether that's materially, energetically, or spiritually. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, and so, so <laughs> home, you know, right there, right to the point. <laughs> hit, 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 hit. Yes, yes, um, excellent. So um, in terms of the, the way that, so I know that it, when we were downstairs, um, you know, talking about the Freetown 2020, mm -hmm. introducing things like the Let Us Breathe collective system, you know, um, you know, very much foreground in the abolitionist uh, uh, politic. Um, there was, um, you know, something that I've, I've, I've always kind of been engaged in spaces to kind of understand this, especially since I, I engage with the Healthy Food Hub to kind of think about economic dimensions. When you think of the word economy, mm -hmm. um, and I know that we, you know we, we've grappled in conversation with you know with frames like capital mm -hmm. and sort of the use of the word capital mm -hmm. and you know how, what that does. Um, what when you think of the word economy, what sort of comes to mind for you, or what what sort of you know what what does that word touch within you? You know, um, or activate within you? Yeah, so much like you know without going. All the way back into it again um, so much of my sense of self was I understand and can communicate to my people notions of finance and economy mm -hmm. uh, so th there's a part of like just like home and my relationship to my mother uh, that is deeply you know connected to that to that notion um, just as a, a theorist and a lover of language and artist and poet uh, you know I get into the word itself and the etymology and I'm sure you've done some of this with, with the audience but you know eco means home literally uh, and and um, uh, the, the nomi means uh, management, right? Yes, management. Right. So, so, so uh, I think of how do we manage, and then my definition of economy, how I use it when I'm teaching or when I'm thinking politically, uh, it is the distribution and exchange of resources. Uh, so this relationship between managing home and this, that's, you know, that's a bag in itself. <laughs> we can just talk about home for an hour. Right. Uh, and then resources and, I, you know, obviously, most times we're talking about material resources. Uh, but if you think about it, you know, when people say like the economy of language or be, you know, economic with your words, it, there's also this notion of being uh, efficient 
and not just having resources, but being resourceful. Mm -hmm. um, and so th those are some of the things that, that come to me. But then I also, you know, think about the needs of our people um, and that, uh, you know, race is in many ways an, an economic creation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so when we think of race as a, a project of plunder, destruction and violence, and then we think of black people as the victims or the survivors, actually, mm -hmm. uh, who are most directly harmed by, you know, that destruction and that plunder. Uh, when I think of economy, I also think of, of my people. Um, and knowing that both our despair and our harm, but also our uh, our solutions and transformation uh, are rooted in, in, in economy and that concept. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, shaping the way that you approach economy, the way that economy is 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 engaged inside of um, the Let Us Breathe Collective, mm -hmm. um, tell me about the nature of relationships mm -hmm. as a sort of economic construct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was a part of that structure. Yeah, I mean, you know, one, a lot of organizations, a lot of movement spaces, like, say that they're family, and fa but, like, you know, in many ways, our, our, our nucleus is rooted in my actual <laughs> family. So, like, my partner or, you know, fiancé or my sister and, you know, her partner. Um, and then also Sharice, who's been with us for about four or five years, and we're, like, the guy parents to our daughter. Um, you know, we function literally as a family. Mm -hmm. uh, and so with that, you know, how we maneuver and negotiate resources, um, because, you know, I've been, all of my work has been volunteer. Uh, I've got no, you know, payment from any of the, the funds that we get. Um, you know, and then 90 to 95% of all the work that happens here is just a labor of love. And so, you know, uh, one, thinking about how do we take care of each other and use our resources to meet each other's needs as opposed to being like, um, arbitrary like market price hourly wage yeah. payment um, that is one thing but then also as somebody who's observed and participated and been adjacent to a lot of other organizational spaces particularly like you know black radical grassroots movement centric spaces um, you see that there's like three things that break folks up or that cause fractioning um, and it's usually how the, the the decisions are made around how resources are distributed and then who benefits from that. Uh, and so just knowing that if we want to create a new world, we have to be it and model it and embody it. Mm -hmm. um, and so how at all times, uh, we can't just be like a nonprofit. We can't be, you know, a political corporation, which is what a lot of times we accidentally aspire towards. Right. Um, how do we subvert all notions of of one money itself as right like as artists that's something that we say like you know we can create the world we want they are doing it money is does, does not exist it is this invisible thing that is only about like our belief uh and so we understand the real concrete impact of the power that supports that system but knowing in its in its objective Mm -hmm. standpoint it's not a real thing so that means we can make our own shit up right uh and you know politically, but also a little bit spiritually, like believing in this law of abundance. And so if we cooperate right, and if we do the right work, and if we build it, uh, we will be able to sustain. So some of that has felt um, naive, and some of that has felt like uh, we might be setting ourselves up for failure, but we have not yet, and we have grown, and we've become more organized and, and like more substantial, still humble, and still very small uh, and grassroots, but trying to think of how do we have circular ways of distributing power and resources in our space, mm -hmm. and whether that's in the language of how we name the positions or literally the ways we operate with each other. It has to be, we have to cooperate. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so talking about uh, envisioning the world that we want to live in, um, how does that drive us into this Freetown 2020 uh, effort to, you know, give us a pitch, yeah. you know, to tell us about what's happening with Freetown 2020. And I, and I promise, I don't promise, I'm going to work hard to be briefer and succinct with this answer. I know, I know, my, I know my strengths and limitations, uh, and this is both. <laughs> um, so Freetown 2020 is uh, a summer land activation series for folks who are familiar uh, with like, you know, the movement for black lives ecosystem in Chicago. You may remember uh, our, our work at Freedom Square that we created in 2016. Um, and that was like a responsive, emergent, organic space. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did not even have a concept of it within three or four days of the launch of it. And we didn't know we would be sleeping over within a day or two of actually doing it. And then when we did that, we thought we would be gone within a weekend. But we were able to sustain this space of land for 41 days, sleeping in, and it was able to exist for six weeks mm -hmm. um, with no bank account, with no resources, literally from just naming what we want 
messaging it to our people, messaging why we're here, which I'll explain in a second, and then resources would show up in surplus. Mm -hmm. And so then we then uh, had the, the responsibility of distributing, but also we weren't tied or beholden to anything. So we could okay. be as equitable as we saw and had autonomy, which has been our story with how we started as well. Uh, so yeah, so Freedom Square was opposing um, one, a specific ordinance, the Blue Lives Matter ordinance. So it was a part of a direct action. And Freedom Square was the lot where folks could go to um, be protected from arrest warnings from folks who were doing civil disobedience work. Uh, and then it emerged into this larger live-in protest across the street from Holman Square, which is a Chicago Police Department operated facility where there have been thousands of cases of undocumented detention and of torture. Uh, and so just naming that, uplifting our abolitionist politic, giving away food, clothes, books, um, some limited medical care, you know, doing youth development and child care work, art, artistic and political educational programming. Uh, so it was really beautiful. It was really our dream in so many ways. Uh, it was also very difficult. It also had its limitations. Uh, and so we now have a building. We now, you know, have four more years of experience. So we're launching something in that ethic of what I call open air organizing, uh, where you could just kind of like walk up. Um, and it's a land activation series. So it's it's centered here in our community. We're in, you can name it a few ways, back of the yards or new city, or we're like just north of the Inglewood border by like three or four blocks. Uh, and so what we want to do is one, center not only um, abolition and our opposition to carceral systems through this divest invest model, divest from policing and militarism, invest in these seven or so needs that communities need to survive, develop and prosper. Uh, but then also, uh, we want to intersect it with and uplift uh, this abolitionist housing platform that we're trying to build um, as displacement and housing instability and homelessness has been the the number one thing that has come up in all of our work. So everywhere we go, we're trying to build with our people. So whether it's in Ferguson, uh, whether it's out in North Lawndale and Freedom Square, whether it's our envisioning justice, we're just trying to do art class with the neighborhood here. Um, at every turn, um, people's housing then jeopardized you know, it became inappropriate to talk about the things that we're talking about, even if it was real, if someone doesn't have somewhere to sleep. So that became priority all the time. Uh, and then that obviously speaks to the larger dynamics of displacement at large and gentrification. Uh, and so how do we, one, figure out how to make the claim that folks should have access to free housing and folks should have irrevocable housing? Um, and substantiate that. So how do we develop that out more? But then how do we go back to you know, a deeper critique of capitalism and the nation state and you know, neo-colonialism and settler colonialism at right. large and how land works and humans' relationship to land, right? Uh, the, I think all forms of human oppression can be traced back foundationally to our relationship and our dominance of land. Uh, you know, once the, the ph philosophical belief that the earth is the domain or is for the dominion of, of man or human beings, uh, you know, we've been on a destructive path. Uh, so, you know, just like the claim of human beings don't own land, we have to share and steward land and protect ourselves within those understandings. Um, and no one should be able to, to deprive shelter of a person. Like, it's not, hey, stop doing it. It, it is, yeah. this, this is, this formation is generally unjust and unsustainable and balanced. Right. Um, and so as we try to stop and mitigate and prevent immediate harms, how do we do that within the, the framework that land ownership in itself is harmful? Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously we want domain because we don't want folks with more violent power to just be able to come and, you know, sweep people off their space or folks not be able to have shelter. So we have to figure out what our relationship will be. But this notion of capital owner, particularly an owner that doesn't have any physical relationship to the land so that I can displace somebody and I live in another neighborhood, another zip code, another city, another state mm -hmm. is inhumane foundationally. So yeah. this is come back to, I failed at being succinct. Uh, this is coming back to, to Freetown. Uh, so we want to do a land activation series. And those are two of our, our central like uh, political platforms, but within that doing all the basic things that we love to do. So, you know, having circles, making fires, drumming, having performance, giving out food and clothes, canvassing and exchanging information with our people and really building movement. Um, Cause that's what we've learned is so much of our work uh, is not regenerative. It is degenerative and exhausting, and you know we 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 burn out. Um, and so, how do we use this space intentionally to build up our organization, to build up people that are coming, and to build up our movement at large? Uh, so, there's some things we want to come away with that we I don't think we need me to speak about in detail. But we have some like goals that are about how do we sustain, expand, and build this movement that is trying to transform our city and world. Absolutely. And so, um, you you you've talked, you've given a bit of a vision already in terms of you know. Um, 
this notion, this this future future centered notion of economy. So you know, I'm I'm always trying to kind of grapple with you know my sense of being in the present, but also recognizing <laughs> yeah. that there's a future out yeah. there that I want to get to. You're living it now. I want to figure out how <laughs> I'm walking towards it. Yeah. Um, so what are like maybe four core values that you would you would see or situate? in this economy that you imagine we might exist in in the future that's that's fair that's more equitable that's you know restorative you know what what are sort of for what are key key critical values for you um that that you would see there hmm, okay that's a great question um so my first thought is around um let's be more concrete and needs based in terms of how we approach resources uh, so one of the things learning canvassing uh, is, you know, what do we need or what, what, what do we, you know, what's your vision for your community, blah, blah, blah. You know, whenever you speak to people about what's needed um, for the last 100 years, at least, uh, what people say is jobs uh, and definitely respect and understand that. Uh, that is our reality. And we support, obviously, organized labor at large. Uh, but however, that's not our ideal of how human beings should be functioning. We should not be depending upon the market and this debt based monetary system to be able to get food, shelter and medicine. Uh, mm -hmm. So how do we have a more resource driven system? Mm -hmm. um, I don't I shouldn't have to give you a thousand dollars to go buy a thousand dollars worth of food only in these places. And I, you should just be able to distribute the food that you need and nutrients directly. You shouldn't have mm -hmm. to uh, pay for for, you know, foundational shelter. And you shouldn't have to pay for foundational medicine to be mm -hmm. able to survive at a basic level. Yes. So, you know, ne centering needs, uh, centering survival needs through direct resources mm -hmm. is definitely one thing um, I think decommodifying time and space. Uh, so that sounds metaphysical, but space and time have become literal commodities. Uh, so, you know, people get paid by the hour. The hour has now become, uh, uh, you know, uh, something that is exchangeable in dollars, right? Uh, and the hour itself is even, even time is a construct, but whatever. Uh, and then land, again, I already mentioned. So decommodifying those things. Uh, um, let me try to think of, of two more uh, direct. Um, uh, oh, yeah, uh, uh, valuing all labor. So, uh, like, taking out this market labor versus unpaid labor, you know. I, I do a lot of work uh, in 90%, or at least stuff I like the most, right? Like, I'm not getting paid or not getting paid immediately. Uh, and it's not that I, you know, I need to be valued more. Um, it is that, you know, raising children should be compensated. Mm -hmm. By who? I'm not sure yet. Maybe the community, you know, maybe a larger community in some sense, um, um, you know, doing emotional labor should be compensated. That is a resource that is that is work. Um, so there's just a lot of work that people need to do that we need to survive and be healthy and that people are doing anyway. That is not being uh, documented, counted um, or or, you know, uh, reified in any type of way. Right. Um, and let me think of, of one more. Uh, so. Resources and needs, decommodifying de de time and space. That's funny. I write all these things down, so I should have the answer. Um, equity mm -hmm. would, would probably be another another thing. Um, you know, the playing field is not even. People need more for different things. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, I think that there are healthy and appropriate, agreeable ways where folks are doing the same labor and receiving different outcomes uh, or receiving different compensation or receiving different access. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we need to center disability. We need to center all social political forms of oppression. Um, and, you know, we need to center parents and children, you know, <laughs> uh, and um, yeah. So so an equitable approach uh, to, to how we take care of those other three things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it was my loose stab at it. I should, I should have thought about that. <laughs> it's all good. You know, Ujima Hour is a place where, you know, we're, we're engaging and grappling with these yeah. ideas because ultimately we, we're always trying to figure out how people are thinking about them. Yeah. And, you know, um, yeah, you know, and we, one of the things that we talk about in Co-op for Living, one of the things that I've been throwing on every single community agreement is, you know, um, adore your first drafts, man. You know, like, I mean, <laughs> whole, my remix on We Can't yeah. Be Articulate all the time. It's like, yo, man. 
first draft. Let us be. <laughs> That's real. Um, so, yes, yes. So, let me just uh, glance over here. Um, there is something going on here in this comment. I just want to make sure that, oh, okay, I don't know what's going on there. Okay. Uh, so, we'll bypass that. But, um, yes, so we've got Damon Williams on here of the Ujima Hour for, you know, a bit a bit more time. Um, if you have a question, make sure you go ahead and throw it in the comment Please section. Um, we'll make sure that we get that answered either now or later. Um you know, and so, um, so, so tell us, you know, how you see people being engaged in um, this Freetown effort. So, you know, you, you talked a bit downstairs just about um, ways that people can plug in, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, 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 and things that you're looking for to, to engage people in. So, you know, just give us a bit of background in terms of that engagement yeah. potential. For this yeah, and, I, and I'll try to be uh, technical first so, so that can, so people can take that. So if you want to plug into Freetown 2020, uh, the rest of the, the months up until Memorial Day. So our, our calendar is Memorial Day to Labor Day, unofficial summer markers. Uh, and so every Monday in March, April, and May, and also we'll continue the program throughout, but Manifest Monday vision sessions are happening right now at Breathing Room 1434 West 51st Street every Monday from 6 to 9. Um, so folks can plug in that way um, and get like a, a, a more in-depth answer. Uh, but, you know, one of the things we need is programming. Uh, so if you are interested and don't know what you want to do, come show up and then we'll have a bunch of things that you can plug into. Uh, if you have a program uh, that, you know, and it's really expansive as long as you are committed to, you know, some certain basic values about justice and right. anti-racism and theoretically it should all be anti-capitalist, but we understand that folks need to get there. So as long as you, you know, can engage that, um, and know that, you know, anti-capitalism, abolition, of carceral systems are central to what we do and mm -hmm. can cooperate with that. Um, come on down and, you know, heal, organize, and create with us. Those are our tenets. Um, and, and so we're looking for artistic and political and educational programming. Mm -hmm. um, definitely that's intergenerational. Definitely that's accessible to people. Uh, and things that, you know, could happen well outside, but also could happen inside. So whether if you're a performer. So really, like, this is a question I get a lot. is like, what can I do? Yes. And, you know, our job, you know, really is to answer with, well, what can you do? Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, what we're working to do is um, create as much space to be able to take that in and then be responsive if we don't already have the space shape to, to, to accept, you know, what folks' capacity and interest are. Uh, so, you know, certainly food, housing, um, you know, educational work, you know, the central, you know, foundations of community are, are needed. But there are things that I can't even conceive of. You know, we, we, we're going to have a, a free store fashion show with the clothes we had. And one of the, you know, the young women that is proposing is like, and I'm going to do hair. And it's a hair show, right? So stuff like that usually goes off my radar of like, just come braid some kids' hair or do a haircut. Right. Or, you know, you want to just come canvas or come help us do a, a community cleanup or come just be an audience member at an open mic or a teaching. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our, our intention or our responsibility is to make sure it is accessible as possible. So there should be really low bars of entry or, or no barriers really to right. entry. So uh, if you're interested or familiar, just, just show up is really the answer. But mm -hmm. you can uh, reach us at the Let Us Breathe Collective dot com. Uh, to kind of, if you want to plug in more intentionally, or email us at letusbreathe2015 at gmail uh, okay. if you want, if you have something now that you are prepared for or that you're interested in. Absolutely, and you don't. You can also visit the Freetown uh, 2020 Vision Sessions um, every Monday, yep. 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. here at the Breathing Room Space, 1434 West 51st Street. Um, so make sure that you plug into those breathing sessions. We'll make sure we recirculate that event on the Coconut Collaborative page, um, so that you can plug in there. We'll make sure that's in the comment section of this video. Um, you know, and and um, yeah, so you know, make sure that you're plugged in. Make sure that you're connected to the Breathing Room Space. Um, they've been generous to to host. Um, you know, the Co-op Co-op for Live, you know, the bi-weekly Sunday gatherings that we do around cooperative economic development history and strategy in black communities. Um, you know, Cold and Collaborative will be doing some of these time salons. He offers a needs markets during Freetown 2020. We're looking forward to that. Um, and so that's, there's lots of opportunities yeah. to get your tethers in. We are team. Know, and just kind of <laughs> cultivate this space. So one of the things that I was kind of twirling around in my head, um, you know, in Co-op for Live, we, we read the next American Revolution. And of course, Grace Lee Boggs, mm -hmm. you know, was very strong around talking about these ideas around cultural organizing and culture mm -hmm. shifting. Mm -hmm. So um, are there sort of intentional or deliberate ways that you see your, yourself, your, your, the collective as a sort of cultural organizers and culture shift? Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. You know, I, I mean, I, I consider myself <laughs> um, 
you know, in many ways, a, a practitioner or even a theorist or a creator or a thinker that is upholding what, you know, what I call a Boxian dialectic, or mm -hmm. I've actually pushed or challenged it to be multilectic to get out of like the binary <laughs> of it. Right. Um, so um, Grace and Jimmy or, or James and Grace Lee Boggs' work, uh, um, uh, Revolution and Evolution in the 20th Century, released in 1974, is the most important text to my life. Um, and in terms of my contributions to shaping like the theory of this space, even before I started learning about what they were doing in Freedom Summer and more of their contemporary stuff, just like the thinking they were doing 40 years ago um, uh, was just so invigorating and magical and, and just fed me um, in a way that, um, you know, shapes me daily. Uh, and so uh, they are... You know, Grace and, and Jimmy are my most important political heroes. Um, and so it, it makes sense that the theory that they had and what it what it turned into, you know, our track emerged along that same path. Um, and then just being an artist and performing myself, certainly see myself as a as a, uh, a cultural organizing, cultural practitioner, among other forms of organizing and realms of humanity. Um, but I'm also working on a project that is continuing those notions so their mm -hmm. book is called revolution and evolution in the 20th century yes. uh, my favorite song is also that same title but it's revolution of evolution it's called and it's shortened to revivev a song by kia cuddy that i think everybody <laughs> should listen to um and so i've been working on this multidisciplinary project series for the last two years and i hope we'll start to be able to come out in the world over the next year or so uh and it's called revolution of evolution in the 21st century um, and the first iteration is building life movement in the black radical hip hop tradition. Yes. Uh, and so I've been working on that piece. Uh, and yes, I, you know, I view that as not only political and talking about the economy and our social standings, but certainly a cultural uh, endeavor itself. And it is a microcosm and an extension in many ways of what our collective work is. And so, uh, you know, we have failed if we are not bringing cultural praxis and creativity and performance to our, our mission. Uh, in any action that we do, so whether whether it's a pro, you know, on on the the days of the Laquan McDonald video release, you know, as the Let Us Breathe Collective took half of the folks because we split and not drop, you know, blocked off a, a highway and created a circle, and then we created an impromptu open mic in that space, right? right. Um, and and his cousins happened to be there, Laquan's first cousins, we didn't know, which is there, and we we're able to speak and perform and play, you know, right. a gospel music on our speaker during this probably the most heightened most risky actions we were ever doing so that's just an example of everything we do when it's particularly politically forefronted we have a cultural foundation to how we are operating and shaping the space uh and so we we intend to continue th that value and practice moving forward <laughs> all right and so you know um I, not not to kind of leave it out on the the sort of icy margins of the conversation but you know we have not touched upon you know the the co-hosting and the co-executive producing of uh ergo oh, radio yeah, 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 yeah. so you know uh, <laughs> what, what sort of the, is the, the the catalytic spark of this sort of media project you uh -huh. know how important is sort of the broadcast format oh, for man. you know the, the 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 ideas and the work that you're kind of engaging with yeah. in the world yeah it goes back uh i won't tell the whole story but you know, on the other side of, of my, my genes, uh, you know, my father is an entertainer and been working in media my whole life. So I grew up going to radio stations, right? Mm -hmm. Like after school, he would pick me up and we got to go to V103 or we got to go to GCI or mm -hmm. he's on for the whole week, right? So, you know, I've known radio personalities my whole life. I've known intimately how radio and all, a lot of forms of media have worked uh, from just being with him. And then once I started doing some of this more community work as a young person, mm -hmm. had a lot of experience on the news and on getting interviewed and that type of thing. Uh, and so, the, you know, the partnership came out of um, another student of that mentor I mentioned who was a, a first-hand student to Jimmy and Grace, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I have, like, some direct lineage and connection there. Um, so, yeah, we just got together. Um, he was showing up. He came to that show, Lack on Lack, uh, mm -hmm. that I mentioned. Uh, and he came to a couple of our, our first actions. Um, and so, you know, just the showing up of it all, um, mm -hmm. then, we, you know, just deepened my respect because we didn't have a deep relationship on campus. We weren't like best friends who like went out to the world with this dream of making it big in the, in the podcast world. Um, but, but however, you know, his skills and interests aligning with my experience and outlook and, and skills and interests as well, um, just lined up with this, with this, with this container that is Ergo. Um, and really what it was, was an attempt to document what was happening. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so a lot of it was like very like what the right now of it, but messaging it towards future generations. Yeah. So as a student and a practitioner, 
um, and somebody in Chicago, Fred Hampton is this looming icon. And so you try to read the assassination or you try to you know, understand the folklore, but I'm real big on firsthand sources and particularly video content or at least audio content that has some image with it. Uh, so I'm going on YouTube and there's you know, less than 60 minutes total if you piece up all the little segments of Fred Hampton that exist. Right. Uh, and that's just such a tragedy for our society and humanity. Yeah. Uh, so our, our idea was the people um, who show up to these protests that was emerging at this time, because this was 2015, so the movement for Black Lives wasn't even a year old yet. Um, the people are the same people who were showing up to these open mics, or at least there was a great overlap. Right. Um, and so that intersection, or that little, that little overlap of the Venn diagram, was really the sweet spot that we wanted to, you know, document and create a living archive that not only the community itself can see and be in conversation with. Uh, but also future generations could have this as a resource in terms of what was movement, what was cultural work looking like in Chicago at this time, which right. we believe will be historic, right? Like, yes. uh, you know, whether it's, you know, Paige May and Charlene Carruthers or Jamila Woods and Raven Lene on the artistic side, right? Like these people from Chicago or who work in Chicago primarily, we believe will have significance for future generations. Uh, and so we wanted to, in their own words, kind of capture their subjective positioning uh, to some collective work. Um, so, you know, through their story, figuring out the spaces and times that shaped all of this really dynamic thought, dynamic creation. Um, and so now we are uh, approaching our five year anniversary, probably about right now, we're probably about to release episode 230 or 231. Uh, we've also found a way to do some partnerships uh, that have been really fruitful and uh, to create like other curated content and then doing a lot of live events um, as well as we, we got funds. Um, to be produce a live series web web special, uh, a, a web series. I'm sorry, I'm getting tired. Um, and so we're calling that a talk show from the future. So it's actually part of the, the framework is what you were just mentioning yes. is that we believe our community, this idea of like living in the future, right? Like it's not just thought; we are embodying it right now. And so we want to invite people into that world and show that there are people in circles having conversations and embodying this future in the same way that folks in reconstruction were living in the future or Absolutely. the Panthers or even more primarily like the MOVE organization in Philadelphia, yes. right? Like they were doing EJ work and animal rights work before that stuff even had language. Right. Uh, so they were living a future that the state couldn't, you know, handle and yes. tolerate. So we believe that that is happening right now as well. Um, so we're about to shoot that here in about two or three weeks okay. um, with folks we've had on the show. Um, so we're really, really excited about that. And just, you know, um, just developing the medium and the form um, and then also becoming educators and teachers about not only radical imagination and dialogue and media, uh, but doing workshops around dialogue itself as a political art form mm -hmm. um, and also uh, an, um, a tool or dis distributor of power. Uh, so whether it's in an artistic space, in an organization or at school or at work, uh, the way people communicate with each other can subvert power dynamics and inequity, mm -hmm. but more times than not, if we're not conscious or aware or setting active agreements um, or building this trust around these new ideals, uh, it's usually perpetuating harmful right. power relationships. And so we, we've also become, you know, theorists or teachers uh, based off our experience on air because we, we both saw that we had the skill. And so then we worked to kind of codify it and build some concepts around it. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's really been gratifying because it makes it feel much more substantial than, hey, just like listen to my podcast. Because we all, you know, no, 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 like shade to anybody. Yeah, but absolutely. like it's a million shows out. So right. Many. And so I got um, 60 streams in my, 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 my pocket. You know, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, not only do I, am I really, really, really proud of the work and the content itself. Yeah. And I feel like we have had some really important we've achieved our goals um, and we have some really important historic conversations, particularly um, two that come up a lot is uh, Mary Kaba and Dave Stovall. So, you know, mm, yeah. go A-I-R-G-O and listen to those two alone. That's not even for me, but for yourself. Absolutely. Um, people come and regularly, probably on a on a weekly basis, I'm hearing about how folks were, you know, impacted by, by, by those two episodes. I definitely uh, remember the mirror. I, I definitely, yeah, yes, you know, yes, and I so it's that. not even about me at that point. Um, but I do have a great, great source of pride of what we actually do, our relationship as partners and co-creators. Um, and and the, 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 I don't want to call it a product, but the, the, the entity, the hub, the, the creation we have been able to contribute to community in the world is uh, it's really been a great honor and a humbling source of pride for me. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I, I look forward to the webisodes, you know, the web, the web uh, broadcast, um, you know, just um, one of the things that 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 was released last year that really kind of really touched me was the movement generations North Pole too, right. Um, and just this notion that, you know, of combining 
um, just an entertaining, you know, useful web medium with these these elements of organizing and culture and just having that intersection and the movement oh, generation is, you know, I, I've been I've been pumping it, you know, and I've been trying to figure out if I'm if I'm actually got the capacity to kind of do a, a screening mm -hmm. little. Uh, uh, Let's do one here. Well, absolutely. <laughs> Will do. El Vejo had a screening. I just don't know how sort of widely circulated it was. Um, little Village Environmental Justice Organization. Yep. Um, but and, and so because they're actually the Just Transition Alliance hub. Uh, member here in, in the sort of Chicago region, okay. um, and you know this is sort of a project of the Just uh, Just Transition Alliance because it's thinking about displacement, it's thinking about environmental justice, and it's thinking about it in a comedic way, right? Mm -hmm. You know this notion of Oakland as the North Pole, where you know you got all these polar bears migrating, <laughs> and, 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 and all the other all the other animals are going extinct, you know, <laughs> the, the native species. So it's it's very comedic, but you know I mean you can do a lot with that format, oh, you know that, that you can't do in the didactic, you know pedagogic yeah. ways or something. Yeah. Yeah. We transmit information. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. I look forward to that. I certainly will, you know, we'll talk more about that North Pole screening. And then, you know, um, yeah, I look forward to seeing, you know, how I can support the other webcast that, yeah. you know, drops. Um, is there sort of a, a closing powerhouse quote or any sort of, a, you know, impactful thought you want to drop on folks before we exit out of this, uh, this space? Yeah, I mean, you know, Ujama is cooperative economics. We just talked about this downstairs. So that's still fresh on my, my, my brain. Um, we, we need to be really expansive when we're thinking about cooperation, right? Like, you know, um, we won't be able to get to time banking and, you know, land trust and these, you know, utopian uh, housing models that are very doable, right? Like, it, it's, not, it's not technical. Um, so there's power and oppression that stops us, obviously, in violence and trauma. Uh, but the way those impacts shapes the way we interact with each other is something that I think we... Um, have not quite done enough mm -hmm. in terms of building some study and building some new practices. So I think we we have um, internalized um, and we can perpetuate scarcity and competition and dominance from our economic system that is the norm. Um, so to create our new world, uh, we have to cooperate with each other. That starts within our household. Uh, the, the, the power dynamics between parents and children is usually right. problematic. Between siblings, right, is yes. usually has some type of conflict. We need to, at every turn, um, be learning and modeling and teaching how to, one, not have to get to the conflict and just be more proactively cooperative and work together and coexist. Yes. Um, so that means healing each other. Uh, that means accepting each other's limitations. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know... Uh, that means assuming folks' best intentions. That means not taking other things personally. That means being grounded in yourself. Um, but but we can't get to taking over city halls or or you know having new global trade arrangements uh, if we don't know how to sit together and and sustain in in intentional relationships for years and years and for generations. Yes. And so you know for me more and more every time I get into new forms of work that becomes more and more primary. Uh, so no matter all, however brilliantly I could talk about how f fucked up the police department is or, you know, talk about representative government, um, none of my ideas will come to fruition because there have been brilliant ideas for 250 years in this space uh, and before. Um, so that's we've not had a shortage of ideas. It's right. it's our capacity to, to, to coexist and live with each other. Um, so, you know, before we get to cooperative economics, we're also going to need cooperative culture cooperative social spaces, cooperative politics, a cooperative consciousness. Uh, yes. And so, you know, to transform the world, we have to transform ourselves. Um, and that's very Boxian. And it's not hunky-dory, and it's definitely not individualistic. Right. It is collective, and it is structural. But it yes. starts in the body, and it starts in the personal. Um, yes. It starts in the interpersonal. Uh, and so, stop being petty. Uh, <laughs> apologize, <laughs> accept apologies, you know, right. you know, transform relationships. But that is more and more what I stand on and like my forefront. We gotta, we gotta be good to each other. We gotta love on each other. Boom, boom. There we have it. Uh, so that folks, you know, concludes this, this episode of the Ujima Hour. Um, and you know, between February and March, you've got two strong principles and two strong values to kind of root yourself in. The one that Joan Fidairo left us with was about mutual aid. Um, and just the, the sort of notion that, you know, mutual aid is everything, you know, yeah. and to, to Joan's words, um, and, and how we cultivate spaces, how we support each other. And then right here, you know, you've got the cooperative culture, cooperative consciousness um, that we are rooted in. So that mutual aid, that cooperative culture, um, putting those two together, we are building an economic value system all throughout the year. 
year 2020 uh, here on the Ujima Hour as we talk to these guests. Um, so we definitely appreciate Damon Williams of the uh, Let Us Be you Collective. So much. You Thank know, you for been... being a minimal and coming here to me. That means a lot. Yes, it's, it's <laughs> been an immense conversation. It's been an immense night, you know, and um, yes, we're looking forward to, you know, all the work that's happening. Freetown 2020, make sure that you follow um, the Let Us Be Collective on Facebook, um, follow them on Instagram, um, hit up the website. Make sure that you um, on the Facebook page, you will be able to find, I'm sure, one of the one of the bit.ly links. I love the LUB participation or the, the Freetown 2020. You hit both of those links. Get your information in the pipeline. Um, build with the collective this year in 2020 and beyond. And, you know, um, yeah. Bring it on. That's a lot to, the to the people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Boom. <laughs> Peace to you all. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. has been the Ujima Hour. Ashe. <laughs>